let's talk about what is going on with the debt ceiling. There are a couple of things that are converging right at the moment. On the one side, you have Joe Biden putting out his budget. Now, this is not directly about the debt ceiling, but it is kind of him positioning himself and creating the messaging he wants about his vision for the country versus the ground that the Republicans are staking out. So in that way, you can sort of see these as, you know, two separate positions on the debt ceiling, even though that's not quite directly the case. All right, let's put this up on the screen in terms of what Joe Biden is proposing. We have some new details this morning I can share with you as well. Um, This is the New York Times. They say he's set to detail $3 trillion in measures to reduce the deficits. This is primarily, uh, the the deficit reduction part of this is primarily about uh, taxes on the wealthy and uh, large corporations. So he, they say, is expected to announce a new tax on households worth more than $100 million would apply to both their earned income and unrealized gains in the value of their liquid assets like stocks. So this is kind of a wealth tax. He will also call for the quadrupling of a tax on stock buybacks that was approved as part of a sweeping tax healthcare and climate bill he signed last year. So um, I'm actually going to go deep on stock buybacks in my monologue today if you guys are interested in such things. The original tax that he levied, I love the way they phrased this was 1%. Hmm. It did absolutely nothing in terms of like curtailing stock buybacks. So when they're like, he's quadrupling a tax on stock buybacks from 1% to 4%. So, wow, that's incredible. They should just be banned outright. Moving on, uh, they also said that it will increase an expansion of an investment tax on high earners, uh, which would be directed to the Medicare trust fund. They uh, say that that plus the proposed savings from additional Medicare negotiations on prescription drugs would reduce deficits by about $900 billion on net. And Sagar, there's additional uh, reporting this month from the Washington Post, I think Jeff Stein was involved in that, that they're going to, in the budget, propose some of the pieces that were initially in Build Back Better, including the expanded child tax credit, some moves on uh, paid family leave, some moves on child care, and some moves on universal pre-K, along with this set of tax hikes on the wealthy effectively uh, in order to, so that's sort of their proposal, is an expanded social safety net, um, plus these tax cuts or tax hikes on the wealthy in order to pay for it. Right. And I think, I know CounterPoints covered this yesterday too, but it bears repeating. Listen, this budget is totally fake. It's not going to happen. There has not been an actual it's a presidential messaging budget, budget That's all it that is. has passed Congress. I want to say since 2000 and not, maybe 2007, the last time that the president delivered a budget, they held hearings on the budget and then yeah. they passed it in full. Our budgeting system is a gigantic mess. It's basically been dead since the days of Obama. So I think people should understand this is basically a campaign document. That's exactly right. It's a messaging document. He's staking out his position, which is high taxes on the rich, expand the social safety net. The Republican position uh, heading into the debt ceiling showdown is quite different. Let's go ahead and put this up on the screen. So uh, this is also the New York Times. They say House GOP prepares to slash federal programs in coming budget showdown. With Social Security and Medicare off the table, conservatives are focusing on a wide range of smaller programs as a clash with Biden and Democrats looms. So um, they have taken off the table after initially sort of like some of them were were flirting with it, but they have now taken off the table Social Security and Medicare. I think Trump was probably very influential on that, as well as honestly Biden in the State of the Union, Mm -hmm. who when they all freaked out, oh, of course we don't cut Social Security and Medicare, even though we've been trying to do that for decades and decades and decades, they kind of back themselves into a corner on that one. So those have been put off the table. And they also don't want to really cut the defense budget other than some like minor line item for a like diversity initiative, which basically amounts to next to nothing in terms of the actual amount of money you would save. So since they put those big pieces on the table, off the table, that means that they have to deeply slash basically everything else. Um, What they are talking about here in this article in particular, they say it includes a 45% cut to foreign aid, uh, adding work requirements for food stamp and Medicaid beneficiaries, 43% cut to housing programs, including phasing out Section 8 altogether, cutting the FBI's counterintelligence budget by nearly half. I think I could probably get behind that piece of it. Um, And eliminating Obamacare expansions to Medicaid to save tens of billions of dollars. Nearly 40 states have accepted that Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act. Um, About 12 million people benefit from that. So what they're proposing here is effectively cutting health care for 12 million Americans, among a lot of other uh, cuts. So that's the position that they found themselves in. And we've been talking about, listen, if you're taking entitlements and defense off the table, 
<laughs> like the math doesn't really work out. You basically have to kill the entire rest of the um, federal budget in yeah. order for this to, to come together with the math that they want. Right. I think it's important for people to understand that too, which is like if you really do want to get serious about it and you don't want to cut defense, like you, there's really no way to do it without impacting a lot of American programs, which are actually broadly popular amongst Republicans. There's a reason that 40, how many states voted for Republicans? Uh, a lot more than four or yeah, a lot less than 10 or a lot more than 10. Yeah. The 10 that haven't expanded uh, Medicaid. And that's because it's actually very popular, especially uh, in the South with a lot of governors who have quietly kind of used it for expansion. I would just say that. And uh, it does not necessarily fit within the spirit of don't touch Social Security and Medicare because Medicaid is also used increasingly also by a lot of uh, Republican voters. So that's one that I would know. And but, it's popular, too, oh, yeah, by it's the way. very popular. Yeah. I mean, look, health care is popular. I don't know why it's exactly difficult for people to get their minds around that. Broadly, in terms of the budget, too, even with the GOP one, it's the same thing. It's a messaging campaign document. It doesn't mean anything. Like, much of this is not going to happen. I increasingly, looking at these two documents, I'm cur curious what you think. I think we're just going right back to sequestration. There is no, for people who don't know what sequestration is, it basically is off the board percentage cuts against, it's like a haircut across the federal government, including with the defense budget. And it's one of the ways that they were able to square it during the Obama years. And it's because there was just no, there was no agreement on anything. Yeah. All they could agree to fund the government was basically haircutting the in all of federal spending. And when you do that, it broadly impacts all programs across the board. So I don't see a way that we get through all of this without yeah. just going right back towards that. And by the way, sequestration was very unpopular. People in the military hated it. People yeah. in domestic programs hated yeah. it. Republicans hated it. Democrats hated it. And that's part of the reason why it was the only compromise. I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I genuinely don't know how it gets resolved. Um, and the deadline is, I mean, it's, it's the summer. So this is not far away. And uh, the Republican caucus, obviously in the House, they have a very small majority. So it's not just getting agreement with mm. the Democrats who, you know, are disgusted with the idea of taking the country's economy hostage to force any spending cuts through. So um, that's the, you know, that's the big barrier. But even within their own caucus, this is an initial sort of like high level plan. But when you actually get to the nitty gritty and people start realizing like, oh, this is going to hurt this project in my district. This is going to hurt this program in my district. My constituents are yep. going to be furious if they lose their health care and they start blaming me. That becomes very dicey as well. And then you have some hardliners in the Republican caucus who are like, I'm not voting for a debt ceiling increase, period. Mm -hmm. Period. End of story. I don't care how many. I'm just not doing it. Period. So I genuinely do not know how this is going to be resolved. And that's why we're continuing to focus on it, because it's this thing that's sort of hanging out there as a real threat to the economy and um, major uh, political like blow up in the near future. And there is no clear resolution. Inside. No, there isn't a clear resolution. That's an important point for everybody to understand, too, which is that we could very certainly get to some sort of debt breach. One of the reasons why I don't think it will matter is that just think about it. You know, you may it, what, eventually what would happen is and all also, McCarthy shot himself in the foot with the motion to vacate. All the Democrats would need to do is force a vote onto the floor through some legislative chicanery, and then you could get some moderate Republicans to join the Dems mm. to push through a debt ceiling package. The only question is whether Hakeem Jeffries would let the Democrats do that. But I do think that if we came down to some showdown and you had only 10 Republicans doing the holdout, I think there are enough Dems who are like, look, we're not going to crash the economy. Let's just pass So you day. think there'll be some sort of a like, what do they call that from a legally blonde? What's the petition? Oh, discharge uh, petition. Discharge petition. Yes. It's, uh, well, discharge petition is a little bit different. I think discharge petition is through a committee, but uh, it is similar principle in terms of Given the rules that McCarthy set forward, if people don't know the history of the original debt ceiling fight, this happened all the time. Boehner would go to Pelosi and be like, listen, I can't pass this thing without you. So I'm going to bring it to the floor. You bring you bring some of your people in, far left, yeah, far but right, the problem vote against. Is, but that's the issue is yeah. because they made it so easy to toss McCarthy. If he does make a deal with right. them, he will know that that's the end of his speakership. It's possible. And that's why yeah. it's so... Um, that's why the positions are so hardened and it's so difficult to see the way that they get out of this. The Republicans are clearly going to, uh, they're either really actually serious and comfortable with uh, breaching the debt ceiling and whatever fallout may occur from that, or they're going to great lengths to bluff mm -hmm. in that regard. Let's go ahead and put this last piece up on the screen because they have um, got, they have taken what they describe as an early step on 
uh, preparing for federal default. And basically what they're doing here is something called debt prioritization, where they're taking all of the however many millions of payments that the federal government um, puts out. And they're trying to say, all right, well, we'll keep paying these ones if we breach the debt ceiling, but not those ones. And they're trying to come up with, like, what does that whole process look like ultimately? Because they want to either signal, like, we're serious, we're not worried about going, you know, breaching the debt ceiling, we've got a plan in place, or because they want to bluff and yeah. want to, like, convince everybody that they're actually serious and try to force cuts that way. Well, it's one of those where w this is a big fight. One of the things that in the previous era they realized is that if you give the executive the authority because they have incoming revenue, they could distribute it the way that they would want to. This would be a way for Congress to bigfoot the Treasury Department and say, no, if we go into default, you're going to spend money exactly the way that we want to. Mm -hmm. We won't let you support social programs. You have to only do, like, debt payoffs or whatever, which yeah. actually be a give giveaway to Wall Street, which is funny. Yeah, but yeah. huge give away to Wall yeah. Street. I mean, it would, if they go forward with it, it would be a huge political, it would be a disaster for the economy and no one should cheer for it. It would be a political gift to Democrats mm -hmm. because they can say, oh, you're paying off the like wealthy bondholders, yes. but you're letting kids go hungry and like stripping people's health care. Well, how, how is that going to look for the Republican Party? So in any case, it's a mess. I don't know how it's going to be resolved and everybody's sort of like staking out their positions right now. Yeah. Good luck. Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now, and Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us, and if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.